Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for yet another book video. In keeping with the theme of Pride Month on my channel, today I want to recommend 10 LGBTQ plus books which I think everyone should read. I actually came up with the idea to do this video when I was on my third queer book of the month and realised that's pretty much all I'm gravitating towards at the moment. For years it was so hard to find good queer literature, people just weren't writing queer books, but recently there's been an explosion of them, particularly in the YA, the young adult category, which I am just living for. I mean like good queer representation for teenagers and young adults is so important. Yes, I know I'm 27 years old now and no longer a young adult, but boy do I live and die for a good bit of YA fiction. Maybe I'll grow up it one day, maybe not. Anyway, I digress. These are not all YA, just some of them are. <laughs> some of these books are probably ones that you've heard of before because I often find that certain books are popular for a reason, usually being that they're very good. But I'm hoping today I can introduce you to at least a couple of new books that you will love and enjoy. I've tried to steer clear of the real big like cult classics. I decided to keep this a top 10 video because this video could be an hour long and it was so hard to narrow it down so if you do want another video with more recommendations and please just let me know, I have way more to talk about. And we're going to start with this book, Tin Man by Sarah Winman. I have never heard anyone talk about this book before. It's one that I read once about four years ago and ever since then the story has just always been in the back of my mind. I remember I had tears streaming down my face for so much of this book. The tagline for this is, this is almost a love story, which perhaps says all you need to know about it. It's this incredibly tender tale of love and growth. It's a story of best friends Ellis and Michael, who are inseparable when they're children, but then they grow up. Ellis ends up getting married to Annie, and the three of them become this sort of unbreakable trio. That is until Michael moves away and they end up drifting apart. Obviously, in keeping with the theme of this video, Ellis and Michael were more than just friends, but their relationship was never straightforward. This is the story of love and loss, heartbreak and complex characters, all overshadowed by the AIDS pandemic of the 80s. In general, I don't really like books which are overly descriptive and this book spends so much time sort of just describing the scenery but the writing is so beautiful that it really works and there's this recurring theme of sunflowers throughout the books which the author uses just wonderfully and there are no speech marks used at all in this. I remember that really putting me off from opening the book when I first got it but again, it just really works. This novel is basically a stream of consciousness, a memory. The first part of the book is told from Ellis's perspective, if I remember correctly, and the second is from Michael's. It jumps back and forth through time, from the 60s through to the 90s. I honestly didn't know it was possible for such a short book to pack such a gut-wrenching punch, but believe me, it can. This is an LGBTQ plus book, but I can guarantee it'll be different to anything else you read, and it's so different from everything else on this list. Here we have another incredible book, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I read this at the beginning of this year or the end of last year, and it's one of those books I just wish I could read again for the very first time. I think about it every day, I recommend it to anyone who will listen. Every single review I saw of this book before I read it said that they can't say much about it because of spoilers and for that reason I actually did debate including it in this video. So if you want to read this book completely spoiler free apart from the fact that I'm including it in this LGBTQ plus video then please just skip along to the next timestamp. I am going to talk about a slight spoiler but it doesn't really ruin the plot I don't think. It was just a really wonderful surprise going into this book, expecting no queerness at all, when it's actually so wonderfully and magically gay. I very nearly didn't read this because I thought it was straight romance, and that just doesn't call for me. And nobody said anything about queerness because of spoilers, but I'm so glad I read this. So this is your PSA. If you've been putting off reading this for the same reason I did, read it. I won't give you any details about the queerness in this book because I feel like that's enough for a teaser spoiler in itself, 
But this is the story of a woman called Evelyn Hugo. She's a movie star from the golden age of Hollywood who in her old age has decided to recount her life story to journalist Monique. So the story jumps between the modern day, which is more focused on the mystery of why is Evelyn Hugo finally breaking her silence and Monique's story, and the past, which is the story of the seven husbands, why this marriage has failed, and under what circumstances she found herself married so many times. I've said this before and I'll say it again, the way that Taylor Jenkins Reid is able to write complex characters is unmatched. She is able to write these real people that you can connect to in a way that I've literally never found before. I've read more of her books and they're all the same. They're all just so well written. This is funny and poignant and just wonderful in every single way. Please read it. Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. Oh, this is another book that I wish I could read again for the very first time. I think I read it only like six weeks ago and I'm still obsessed with the story. I talk about all the time to the point where my girlfriend is like, please stop talking about this bloody book. I don't actually have the book to show you because I bought it on my Kindle and I have this thing where if I think I'm really going to love a book, which I knew I was going to with this from what I'd already heard, I always try to buy the actual paperback version, but it was weirdly sold out everywhere like it wasn't even on Amazon I couldn't find it anywhere so I bought it on my Kindle and I'm glad I did because I'm really happy I read it but I just want to have the book just to keep it and love it forever. I've actually seen quite a few mixed opinions on this book so I want to say outright obviously that I loved it. It was actually one of those times where I kept finding myself binge reading this and then I'd hide it away for a couple of days to slow myself down because I just didn't want the story and the world to end. The premise of this book is something which I am furious I didn't think of myself. So Alex Claremont Diaz, the first son of the United States, and Prince Henry, the grandson of the Queen of England, fall in love. I would say outright this book is not royally, politically or historically accurate at many points, and if you're the kind of person who's bothered by things like that, that could be a problem. Luckily, I don't care. It's not all completely accurate, but it's a story. That seems to be one of the major criticisms of the book that I've seen online, which just seems really silly to me because, like I said, it's a story, it's a book, but each their own. I've spent a really long time trying to pinpoint exactly what it was about this book that made me feel so many things. And I've come to the conclusion that it's because this is such an honest account of relationships in your 20s and even coming out to yourself in your 20s. So many books like this are about teenagers, which do become harder to relate to the older you get. But this one just felt so relatable and real to me, despite the premise being so far from anything anyone has ever experienced. This is just a depiction of a really freaking sweet, adorable gay relationship. There were obviously some obstacles to overcome in the storyline, but I really liked how sort of just communication was the key to solving all. There was minimal melodrama, just an adult relationship with its obvious issues. One of the issues is the whole coming out thing, which is hard to do justice I find, but because the coming out in this book was on a much bigger level than for most people, I didn't really find it overdone. Obviously this is the Prince of England and the first son of the United States, coming out. Plus it was really nice to see a supportive liberal family accept the fact their child's gay in comparison it's sort of juxtaposed with the other family. The main characters are obviously Alex and Henry but the supporting cast of this book is also fantastic and they're all really well fleshed out I thought. The supporting cast aren't just these two-dimensional characters and there's this recurring theme throughout this book of loving somebody on purpose choosing to love despite the highs and lows, choosing to stick with this person. Oh, uh, it was amazing, I'm gonna shut up about it now, but I'm awaiting a movie of this book and it better be good. <laughs> Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. This is another one that I read on my Kindle. And I'm not gonna lie to you, this book very, very nearly didn't make this list. But I've come to the conclusion that I didn't dislike this book, actually quite the opposite, I did like the book. I just didn't enjoy reading it because it's not my kind of thing, if that makes sense. Like it was just difficult for me to read, but the storyline I did like. 
That's not to say I don't think anyone would enjoy reading this, and I think the story is really important, it just wasn't my kind of writing. This is a story written by a trans woman about a trans woman, and it's quite rough and jarring at times, it's provocative, it's not supposed to be some fluffy story written for cis people about being transgender. This is gritty, it makes you think, and it had me clutching my pearls at some point, but I think that was the point. This story is about three people in New York City. Reese, a transgender woman, her ex-girlfriend Ames, who transitioned male to female before eventually deciding to detransition, so she's not not transgender, but just she couldn't live as a woman in society. And then there's Katrina, who's Ames's lover, who finds herself unexpectedly pregnant. Ames doesn't think he has it in him to be a father to this child, and so he reconnects with Reese to propose this unconventional family where the three of them raise this child together. All Reese has ever wanted was to be a mother, mothering everyone she could along the way on her own journey, and now she's got this choice and she's got to decide if it's what she really wants. This is brutally honest, it takes all aspects of living as a transgender woman in modern day. Internalised misogyny, gender stereotypes, sex, wokeness, motherhood, community, heteronormativity, it covers everything. And I don't think a single one of these characters is likeable, they're all very raw and rough around the edges. This is more of a character study than a story, I would say. There's nothing that really happens in the 350 odd pages of this book, there's no huge plotline. It's just a deep dive into the motivations behind each decision the characters in this story make. I found the ending of this book deeply unsatisfying, but honestly I'm not entirely sure what I expected or even wanted to happen at the end. There's probably some comment to be made about big decisions and moments in life never having a nice ending tied up with a bow, but oh is it unsatisfying in a book. So in conclusion, this book is definitely worth reading in my opinion, I think it's really important, but it's a difficult read, or at least it was for me anyway. What can I say, I like a plot, I like a twist, and this book didn't really have them, but I feel like I learnt loads. The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue by Mackenzie Lee. I'm pretty sure I've already raved about this book fairly recently in a video, but if you're a bit of a history nerd, then boy oh boy do I have the book for you. This is the story of Henry Montague aka Monty, his younger sister Felicity and his best friend Percy. After years of messing around, drinking, sleeping with whoever he desired, Monty has one last summer to sow his wild oats before being expected to take over as his father's heir and become a responsible adult, finally. So he embarks on this grand tour of Europe, which is sort of a rite of passage for every high class man in the 1700s. Only of course, nothing goes as planned and it turns into a wild goose chase across the continent. This is a story based in solving a mystery, which I'm sure will be up a lot of your streets if already the queerness and the historyness hasn't got you. The storyline is completely fantastical, there's almost no way this would actually happen in real life, but it's a book. But what is a bit more based in reality is the fact that Monty is hopelessly and madly in love with his best friend Percy and has been for years. But this is the 1700s, men can't be together, and he doesn't even think Percy feels the same anyway. Until things start to happen and things get strange. First things first, I love the bisexual representation in this book. The majority of fiction you'll find with a bisexual main character, and that's rare as it is, will tend to be female, so it's really refreshing having an unashamed male bisexual main character. This book tackles a lot of issues without ever feeling preachy or like it's just being shoved in to make a point. Like, you know what I mean when a book has nothing to do with a certain topic, but goes weirdly out of its way to mention it? It drives me mad. Like, I love a good social justice conversation as much as the rest of us, but it's got to flow, you know, otherwise it just feels like it's been shoved in for no reason. But this book tackles sexuality, homophobia, racism and gender equalities and expected roles fantastically. It just all fits really well within the plot of the book, and it's so well written. 
and this book is funny like it takes a lot for a book to actually make me laugh out loud and this book managed it several times and 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 there are actually two sequels to this I have the Lady's Guide to Petticoats and Piracy right here somewhere. Where is it? Oh yeah, here. Here, and I haven't actually read it yet, but I'm going on holiday next week. And I think this is gonna be my first read on holiday, which I'm so excited for. And there's a third book as well called The Nobleman's Guide to Scandals and Shipwrecks, which I'm also gonna read, I'm sure. So I will keep you posted. The Miseducation of Cameron Post by Emily M. Danforth. This is a classic, and it's a classic for a reason. This is one of the first ever woman loving woman books that I read, and it tore my heart into a million pieces and put it back together again, and it will always hold a special place in my heart. Cameron Post's parents suddenly die in a car crash when she's a teenager, on the same day that she's been kissing a girl, and her first thought is relief that she's never gonna have to tell her parents who she really is, that she's gay. And then she's forced to move in with her conservative and very religious Aunt Ruth. And then Coley Taylor comes along, beautiful, beautiful Coley Taylor, who turns Cameron's world on its head, which eventually results in her being sent off to God's Promise, a Christian conversion camp. I find there's something so painfully and heart-wrenchingly relatable about Cameron's realisation, about her feelings for Coley, her sexuality. So many gay people, gay women, have a story to tell that's not all too far from Cameron's. You know, there's always just that one girl, you know, the one girl. I just remember reading this for the first time whilst I was going through something, you know, and it was like my own thoughts and feelings had been put onto paper in Cameron's voice. It was... I don't know if that was just me, I don't know if that's a relatable thing for everyone else, but for that reason, this book will always be so special to me. You may have actually seen the movie based on this book, which is pretty much all based at the camp. And whilst I do like the movie, I think it's Chloe Moretz playing Cameron. And there definitely is a place for the movie. It just doesn't hold a candle to the book, in my opinion. The entire half of this pretty chunky book is the before. Cameron's life at home, her feelings, her relationships, her teenage angst. It's written so beautifully and set in Montana in the 90s and you can just almost like feel it. You feel like you're there, you know? There's something to be said for an author that's able to create such vivid imagery. I see a lot of people say in reviews of this that the first half of the book dragged on too much, but when I read it, I just remember wishing that it would continue. I actually preferred the first half to the second half of the book, which is about the camp. That part is still good, it's just not as good. I mean, what can I say? Maybe I just enjoy an unrequited love story. Like I said, at the time I read this, I could relate so deeply. I would actually be really interested to read this again now, a few years on, see if I get that sort of same feeling. But I kind of don't want to destroy the nostalgia I have for this book. This book just feels honest and real, but I suppose the real importance in this book is the focus on the conversion camp. A lot of the focus in this book is obviously around religion and sexuality, which does make me squirm, but it's supposed to be uncomfortable. I thankfully was not raised religious, and I had enough angst as it was, so I can't imagine how hard it is going through questioning your sexuality, either religious yourself or surrounded by religion. Just read this book. Just promise me, pinky promise, you're going to read this book. They Both Die at the End by Adam Silvera. This book is not a rub it in your face gay romance, but it is gay and romantic and dystopian and I love it a lot. This is set in a very strange future where if you're going to die, you receive a text from something called Death Cast shortly after midnight on the day of your death telling you so, so you can prepare and do all the things you wanted to do, or not. It's called your end day, so you decide how you live it. On September 5th, both Mateo and Rufus, two complete strangers, receive said text and they connect on an app called Last Friend. I mean, think of Tinder for people who are about to die. Rufus and Mateo decide to meet up to have an adventure together on their last day, and as you can guess, things turn romantic. But it's not in-your-face romance, it's kind of slow-burning, slowly-sneaking kind of romance that just really hits you. And this entire book happens over the space of just one day, obviously. 
I'm not gonna lie to you, I read this book a really long time ago and I gave it away stupidly, so I can't remember the specific details of it and I can't even flick through it to remind myself. But I just remember thoroughly enjoying this book and crying a lot. I think this book divides a lot of people, a lot of people say the book is a cliche, but my only criticism is that I just wish it was longer, perhaps even part of a series. I feel like this world could have been explored so much more, the feelings of the relationship could have been explored so much more. But when the whole premise of the book is people dying within 24 hours, I do suppose there's limited potential there for a series, but I just wish there was more of it. Aristotle and Dante discover the secrets of the universe by Benjamin Aliro Sainez. This is my favourite book of all time and I'm sure a lot of my avid book video watchers are absolutely sick to death of me talking about this book but I will never stop, never. I will love this book until the day I die and you will not stop me talking about it. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, this is a story of Aristotle or Ari and Dante and their relationship. Not just a romantic relationship but their friendship, how they come together and grow apart how they grow and fall in love despite the other's flaws. There are a lot of books written about gay relationships for straight people, but this book is written for gay people. So much of what Sainez writes in this book captures my experience, my thoughts, my feelings, and it's something that you can only write and truly understand if you're queer yourself. So the story begins with two 15 year old boys and follows them over the next few years, as they begin to discover themselves and each other, how their families mould who they are and who they're to become. One of the main themes of this book is family and both of these boys have incredible families who they have to work to understand and their families have to work to understand them, which I think is something that's not often talked about in life, how you've got to grow to learn things about your family that you never knew before, how eventually you begin to see your parents as people rather than parents, flaws and all. Perhaps similar to what I said about Detransition Baby, there's no huge overarching plotline in this story, there's no huge plot twist, it's just about Ari and Dante and their character development, polar opposite people who learn to love the other. The romance in this one is a slow burn, almost frustratingly slow, but then again, all the best romances are. This is a true coming of age book, it's definitely YA, but please, please, please do not let that put you off. I have never found a better romance book than this one, and I doubt I ever will. Everything about this book is just beautiful. The writing, the characters, the relationships, just mwah, chef's kiss. And I'm so happy to say there's actually finally a sequel being released in October of this year, which I have officially pre-ordered, so I will be the first to report back. I'm very nervous for the sequel, I don't want it to ruin this, but Sainez has spent years writing it and it hasn't been rushed, so my hopes are very high. Carol by Patricia Highsmith, the lesbian classic, Carol. One of my favourite movies of all time, thank you Kate Blanchett and one of my favourite books of all time. I don't actually have it to show you because I loaned it to a friend, but I promise you I do own it. So this book was first published in 1952, I think under the name The Price of Salt, and it was controversial to say the least. Patricia Highsmith even wrote it under a pseudonym and didn't take ownership of the book until the 80s. This was the first book to depict a lesbian relationship with a happy ending. At the time of its release, any queer media had to end tragically or with the protagonist ending up with the opposite sex or in jail or just somewhere bad to prove that homosexuality was bad and only caused unhappiness. Carol refused to do that. Perhaps even me saying that could be considered a spoiler, but this book's been around for 70 years and that's kind of what makes it special, so do excuse me. I do think by today's standards calling it a happy ending is a bit much, but it's definitely not completely tragic by any means. The protagonist's journeys do not come without their trials and tribulations, it's a woman being forced to choose between her love for her child and her respect for herself, the need to live an authentic life. What price do you pay to live as who you truly are? This is a story of Carol and Therese who meet one day and are just drawn to each other like moths to a flame, and the storyline follows their attempts to be together. 
This is again a very slow burning romance, again painfully slow, but it all adds to the suspense. And this does mean that the story as a whole is quite slow, but you've got to stick in there. It gets much more fast paced in the second half of the book, I promise. And it is a difficult read because it was written so long ago and the language and the style reflects it. But I think that just adds to the beauty of the story for me. I couldn't sit down and binge it all in one go. Had to do it just a chapter at a time and I loved it. And finally, we have a book which just made it onto the list. As I actually only finished reading this a few days ago, I had it on pre-order for ages. And isn't this just the most beautiful book you've ever seen? This is Felix Ever After by Kaysen Callender. It's a book written about a transgender teen by a transgender person. Queer fiction is always so much better when it's written by a queer person, there's no denying that. So this is a story of Felix Love, a black, transgender, queer teen male who is desperately searching for love in New York City. It isn't a secret that Felix is trans, but one day he turns up at his school, his art college, and finds a huge blown up photo of him pre-transition captioned with his dead name. And then he starts receiving anonymous transphobic threatening text messages and he needs to find out who's responsible and as you would guess, hijinks ensue. This book has so much LGBTQ plus representation but it doesn't feel forced at all. I think the fact that Felix attends an art college makes the amount of queer people in his story believable. Don't get me wrong, I clearly love a queer book, but sometimes the amount of queerness can feel forced, which kind of goes against the point, you want it to be natural. And I was concerned at one point this book was going to be that way, but it didn't go there, it's just wonderful. It features a strong-ish supportive relationship with Felix's dad, bar just some middle-aged person confusion and misunderstandings, and it has strong friendships, I love the way that friendships grew throughout this book. It talks about gender and sexuality and how it's not black and white, how it's on a spectrum and how so many people push gender and sexuality into a binary but both are fluid and that's represented really well in this book. Sometimes people can't quite put a label on themselves, sometimes the words don't quite fit and that's okay. I feel like the blurb of this book really focuses on how Felix Love has never been in love and whilst love and relationships are definitely a key part of this book, I don't think they're the most important thing. The strongest storyline in this book to me is the exploration, the teenager discovering who they are and who they want to be in a world where they don't quite fit in. Regardless of gender identity, I think that's a universal experience for pretty much all teenagers, correct me if I'm wrong. I think pretty much anyone could read and relate to this book, but especially if you are a transgender teen, I can imagine this book would be just everything to you. And so there you go, there are 10 LGBTQ plus books that I think you should read. Please, please, please put in your comments more recommendations that you think I should check out. And of course, I will have my Goodreads linked down below. I'm pretty sure my name over there is just Georgia Marie XO, but I will double check that, I'll put it on screen. Um, so please go follow me over there, I update it all the time. Thank you for watching I suppose and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.